Hello, my friends. Would you like rich, dark, loose, well-draining soil that's highly fertile, needs very little amendment, and produces for you year after year, and for generations to come? Then you're looking for biochar. This soil had biochar mixed into it maybe five years ago. This is one of my raised beds. Just out here winterizing. It's the only amendment my soils get is a yearly mulch. Or if the mulch disappears in the summer, I'll add a little. I don't add compost, fertilizers, manures, anything like that. Now if I add them in excess, I'd use them, of course, and incorporate them into my gardening, but they are not necessary for my gardening. Here's a pile of charged biochar. And at the end of the process, when you make biochar, this is what you get before you mix it into the soil. Rich, dark, pure crystallized carbon. Now, of course, all biochar is not made equally. Not all charcoal is good biochar. So if you want to make high quality, purified, crystallized carbon, I'll show you how to do it in the easiest and what I consider the best method. So come along and let's make some biochar. One of the questions I often get or comments people leave is that they don't have room or material to make their own biochar. Well, first of all, the material uh, if you're gardening, you do have material coming out of your garden. This is all uh, tomato plants. I just put them in a pile, just kick, kicking them over and rotating them in the sun so they dry out a bit. All this pile here you see are branches from the ornamental trees in my yard, not even from the uh, surrounding bush. This isn't even accessing the resources I you know, have here on an acreage. You know, this is common to pretty much everyone's yard if you have a couple trees or a few bushes or you're growing things in your garden. Other things are great like sunflower stalks, corn stalks, corn uh, cobs, the husks, all that stuff can be turned into biochar. Essentially anything organic, right? You don't need a forest or an endless supply, right? This is going to make quite a bit of biochar. Should probably make enough that I could incorporate into a 4x8 bed, no problem. Just out of one burn. It's real easy. You can also burn things like eggshells. I got some bones here the dog was chewing on. Paper towel. I have some, uh, and that looks like beeswax I left out. When it rained and we had forest fires, so it was all black with ashes. I don't want to use it for anything. But yeah, you know, bones and uh, things you don't want to put in your compost. Maybe citrus peels, uh, onion peels, you know, stuff like that. You can burn that all. That all burn and turn into a biochar. And then, of course, everyone says, well, I don't have room. I can't, you know, burn anything. I don't know how well you can see this. Maybe go down at an angle or something. That's not good either. But it's a simple cone pit, okay? This is how you make the best, highest quality biochar because the shape of the pit actually matters in how the fire performs and how you're layering. Each layer covers completely the one beneath it, preventing oxygen to get in. You, get, you don't get that effect in a square pit or a trench. Don't dig a trench, right? Don't follow YouTube fads. If you're serious about making good soil, then follow people that use science and common sense. This is the easiest thing to do, okay? So this method isn't good for people who like to overcomplicate things or make work for themselves. This is a simple cone pit. People ask how big is it? It doesn't matter. The size doesn't matter. The shape matters. All the sides must meet together in the middle at the bottom. But this one specifically is about three feet across in diameter and almost two feet deep. 
It produces a good burn, produces about three quarters uh, of my wheelbarrow, which I'm not sure how many cubic feet my wheelbarrow is, but it's a three or four, right? Anymore. So of course I'm going to have a burn. It's important with biochar too. You can improve the quality of it if you uh, douse it quickly. Right? You're going <clears> to <throat> like fracking or whatever. It's going to split and break up the uh, carbon to charcoal uh, when the cold water hits the hot charcoal on mass, right? So I'm going to fill out a couple buckets of water. I'm going to have the hose here because I'm having a fire and let's get going. Okay, so the first important thing is that you have a cone shaped hole. Second important thing is you start to fire in the bottom. Don't fill all your stuff in and start from the top. That defeats the whole purpose of what we're doing. Then we'll give you a bunch of ash and poor quality charcoal. You want high quality charcoal, right? You want good soil like the soil I have, or the soil you could have, which may be better than mine, right? And you can turn any soil, any soil you have, any dirt you think is unusable, you can turn it into the best garden soil ever. Right? Strong claims, right? I didn't discover this, you know, on YouTube, okay? I've been doing this for 10 years. I discovered it probably close to 20 years ago. Um, actually, I'll find a book I discovered it in. It wasn't even about gardening or anything. It was uh, about North and South America before Columbus was here. I found many interesting things in the book. And one of them led me to biochar. But you'll see as a trend on YouTube every once in a while, you know, Terra Preta, biochar and everything and most of it people are just plain simply making it wrong right they're not making high quality charcoal which is what you want okay it wasn't the poor quality cooking charcoal that lasted for thousands of years in the amazon it was uh they knew what they were doing it was for agriculture but we're not making terra preta we're an anthropological study we're getting into political ideologies that affect science. I'm going to show you how to build a fire that's very efficient at producing high quality charcoal, which then we're going to turn into biochar. And then we're going to turn any crappy soil you might have into some awesome stuff. So again, start the fire in the bottom. It's good to have lots of small stuff, some straw, or hay or something that hasn't been sprayed with herbicides, of course, or chemicals. You don't want to put anything with chemicals in here, right? Don't burn your garbage. You can burn your kitchen waste, or your garden waste, or anything like that. But I'm not going to try to waste uh, too much of the small stuff. Sorry, the dog is knocking the camera. <laughs> There might be a few barks and carrying on. I've already had to uh, restart the video once for motorcycles, you know, copyright music and all that. Blasting their tunes down the highway. Over here. So, yeah, once you get the fire going, even that is good enough. Start building up with the larger sticks. Once you think it's going fairly well, you can start smashing it down. I like to use a shovel. And of course, depending on what you're burning, you can scale this up. You can even build a smaller hole and have a smaller fire. But, uh, yeah. I mean, you can make a cone six feet across and burn, burn a forest in it, right? And produce biochar or produce charcoal. As you're building the fire, you want to keep all the fuel, whatever you're burning, keep it fairly flat. 
don't build it up like a teepee in case again it's not a cook fire or a campfire or something. And you want to compact as much as you can without putting it out. Now when the fires are starting like this one is, it's okay to get a little ash and get things. You want a good fire going before you load on everything on top. But I just thought I should mention, again, don't build it up like a conventional fire because that's not what this is. You can when you're very first starting it, if you have just a little bit of tinder uh, and a few sticks or whatever, you can make a little uh, teepee in the bottom. But uh, once it starts going, flatten it down. Everything you add, put in flat layers, alternating layers. Maybe put the sticks one way and then the other way across. But I'm just going to get this burning good. And we'll get to the middle of the fire. I'll show you uh, what else you can add to these fires in case you don't have a lot of sticks or if you have a lot of other organic material you want to burn. Here you can see how I'm layering them. Each layer is going to alternate. Right, so all, all this fuel I'm putting on is laid out next to each other forming a layer on top. Now as you see that's the layer you want on fire burning. Uh, as the fire builds up you'll get less and less fire coming from underneath because we're going to cover everything underneath with the next layer. That's why the cone shape is essential and the same results cannot be achieved in a trench or some other method or above ground or in your barbecue you know wherever else people are doing things. You can achieve high quality charcoal using a retort system but then you're burning as much or more fuel to produce the charcoal. This system is a very simple ancient way of doing it. I did not invent this or reinvent it or change it in any way, right? This is the simplest way. All your fuel turns into product. You're not losing anything. You're not making a bunch of ash. You're not polluting the atmosphere. The only thing coming off here, as you can see, there's no smoke. Maybe I'll raise the camera up a bit so you can see. Well, it's mid-October too, so this isn't dry wood. It's been out here in the rain and the damp mornings and nights. And it hasn't got warm enough during the day to dry everything out perfectly. There's no smoke. The vortex it creates, circular motions, the shape of the fire, right? It's all physics and chemistry. And it's not a magical mystery. And our ancestors knew more about fire than we do now. Unless you're Stephen Hawkins or something. But he probably doesn't realize what he knows applies to such things as fire. He's too smart to be sitting out back. <laughs> Uh, it's making fire and messing with dirt, right? Don't mind me, I don't know what I was talking about there. Okay, so, subsequent layer. You can start putting on larger materials. And again, you want to completely cover the layer, previous layer. By doing that, the fire on top will be drawing in the oxygen depriving it of the layers beneath. Now you see a little bit of white there that is turned to ash a bit. That will happen if you sit around talking to the camera and not adding fuel. Now by adding the fuel the fire dies down a bit. A good trick is to add a little bit of your smaller stuff along with it just to bring that fire back up. Well, it's good to have a lot of small stuff and not to use it all in the beginning. Right there, like I said, damp wet wood. It'll take a minute to light up. Yeah, if you're used to uh, making fires for various things, this style of fire, or what I'm doing here, is going to go against some of uh, your instincts, right? 
but trust me, there, there's a madness behind this method, right? And it's not so mad. It does produce the highest quality charcoal you can produce in your yard without a retort system. And again, those things waste as much fuel as they produce product. This, your fuel, is your product. I don't see why this doesn't make more sense. I think people don't like this method because again it's too easy and some people just like to make things difficult and everyone likes to modify it to whatever they're doing, right? You don't want to dig a cone, you want to use a barrel, you know, that's fine, right? But you're not producing the same thing, you're not producing the same quality. Um, if you want uh, another YouTuber who, who backs up what I'm saying, as evidence, uh, Cody Labs does some good work with biochar. Uh, the various sizes of the finalized product, how it affects it in the soil, uh, various methods how to make it. He concluded, of course, the cone shape is the superior method to everything. He even suggested it was superior to retort. I suggest retort makes great biochar. It just wastes a lot of energy in doing so. Uh, and a lot of fuel, which could be a uh, product. But yeah, you just want to keep building up your fire. And again, this is all just uh, fallen branches. All right, I didn't have to go in the forest or harvest anything. I, I, moved them off the lawn or wherever they fell and broke them up and piled them up. This will make a significant amount of char which you'll see when I'm at the end. But again, okay, so here's where it might go against your instinct, right? If this was a TP shape to the wood burning, it would burn more efficient, right? It's a slow constant feed to it, not like I'm doing here talking to the camera and throwing on a bunch and everything. But yeah, so it goes out like that. Good trick I use is just throwing a bunch of small stuff and fan it with something, get it going. But it'll pick up on its own and will pick up again when it's further along.
to there. I just noticed as I was adding peel, it was dying back a bit. You know, I'm suffocating it, of course, adding the layers. So I just mixed in a bit of the small stuff. And as you can see, it helps. And there, it's on its way to going again. This is probably 40 minutes, 45 minutes into it. Getting to on an hour here. It's getting very hot. At this point, you can start adding your eggshells, your bones. Slowly, you don't want to drown the fire with the wet uh, kitchen scraps or anything. But I think I'll start to add a few things like the tomato plants. Add stuff like this slow or it will suffocate the fire, smother it out, and it's still kind of damp and moist. But as you can see, the fire is hot enough to quickly, uh, quickly burn that down. Yeah, that was. Uh, not quite dry yet, tomato plant. Uh, it's in bones, eggshells. Find eggshells are best unbroken. If they're all smashed up, I tossed in a bunch of smashed up ones and and quite all turned black. There's still a little bit of light. I think they're just too close together or something. Mix them in, I guess. But yeah, it's pretty simple. All it is is just a matter of continuous, continuously feeding it. And it takes a while, well over an hour, I'd say. So I'll pick it back up again and save you the hassle. I don't know how well you can see that, but I've tossed on all the kitchen scraps. And actually, they're quite wet because uh, <clears throat> water got in the bucket I had them stored in. But uh, it's burning. Didn't put the fire out. What I got in there is uh, eggshells, uh, citrus peel. There's some uh, tea bags, paper towels. There was some uh, nasty honeycomb I didn't want to process. Uh, just random stuff, all organic. Uh, no garbage. All right. Basically compost. But now the calcium from the eggshells is going to be calcium uh, crystal and with the carbon crystal and uh, it'll be useful in the soil. So you can throw pretty much anything. You can say it's not plastic or it's paint or stains or anything on it. <clears throat> Don't put your treated wood in there and all that. But uh, yeah burns hot enough you can burn bones you can burn pretty much anything you put on it so I'm gonna continue doing just that this is about an hour and a half I've lost count actually uh, could be close to two hours and I burned uh, a lot of large pieces I burned all my kitchen waste, all the eggshells and bones and such, and uh, the garden waste, uh, the green uh, tomato plants. They all burned up very nicely. The only thing that didn't seem to burn very nice was some uh, paper towel that was wet. But uh, that's no big deal, I don't really care. It doesn't affect anything, right? So when you get to this stage, after I was burning the large pieces, and when I'm getting close to the edge or to ground level, <clears throat> I start putting on smaller pieces. But as you can see here, I've left this so you can see. You start getting uh, ash, all that white ash. Now the best, absolutely best thing I found uh, to finish a fire is like straw, right? Some old dried straw or alfalfa or uh, hay, 
some sort of uh, animal feed. You got a big bale of it. You can lay a layer on that. <clears throat> it turns black real quick. It burns, it turns black real quick. Doesn't seem to ash as easy if you uh, smash it down as you go. Now, I don't have anything like that. I've uh, burned all the things I had like that. Uh, I guess if you gathered up some uh, <clears throat> dry, dry grass, right, the tall brown grass, that would work also. But uh, what I use, the same thing I used just to start the fire. That's why I try to use very little of my small stuff to get the fire going. These, as you see here, because of the size of the hole, uh, or the shape of the hole, I mean, the cone shape, uh, all the layers beneath are completely covered. So the only fire is on a top layer. So if you don't add the small stuff, that larger stuff that was still not fully burnt near the top, is going to be uh, a lot of ash and an incomplete burn. So you want a few, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 minutes of burning, like I said, straw, you know, a bale of dry animal feed. No longer good, great for the animals or whatever. Uh, just something light, right? It's not going to take too long to burn, but will, uh, but will burn, so that the stuff underneath doesn't get oxidized and turn to ash, like it's doing as I'm talking. So a couple of hints too. Uh, you can stir up the fire the fire in the middle sometimes, especially if you're putting on wet stuff like I did with the kitchen kitchen scraps that have been sitting in the bucket in the rain, or the uh, garden scraps, the still kind of green tomato plants. Uh, there might be a ball of you know, stuff that hasn't uh, burned very well in the middle. So if you dig around in the middle, that's a good tip. It helps a lot. Because sometimes you do find stuff that's burnt. I'm not too worried about it. Like if you're actually standing here, this is extremely hot fire. But yeah, that's all there is to it. Now I'm going to keep adding the small stuff. You can see why I'm adding it. It burns quickly, right? It also takes all the oxygen away from the stuff underneath. Gives it a chance to turn into charcoal. instead of just burning away to ash. Okay. Also had suggestions of burying it with uh, dirt. Okay. That's actually a process to produce uh, a certain kind of charcoal for cooking, but it also produces a lot of ash, which I don't want. Right? And it's an incomplete uh, crystallization of the carbon. So you get a lot of the residual oils and different things. You don't want it in your soil. It's okay if you're cooking over it or something, but you don't want it in your soil. So each different kind of fire is different because it has a different purpose. Okay, this one produces, like I said, high quality charcoal. So yeah, funny. Add it down, stir it around at this point, and you are going to get a little bit of ash, but ideally it's just going to be like this, right? Right on top, a thin layer. We're going to douse this with water right away. And we'll let it burn a bit. Uh, some larger pieces still. Near the top. But even that, don't worry too much. If there's pieces that aren't quite burnt when you're processing it, like I'll show you, um, just throw them back into your next batch. 
Now this didn't make this didn't make use of everything I had. I still have enough uh, wood, like you saw in the beginning of the video, to make another one. I thought it would burn through more but with everything else I put in there. I didn't have to burn just the branches, right? So. Yeah, just get yourself a nice drink or something, a cold drink in a lawn chair. Just sit there, tossing a piece at a time in. If you want to watch this in real time, I have a video in real time. It's rather long. This one's going to be long too, I guess. But I do do this process in real time. This one I've uh, cut a lot at a time out and jumped from one part to the next because I want to show the results and then show what I do to it after, all the way up to what you saw in the very beginning of the soil, right? So, I'm just gonna let this burn down a bit, even like this now, I could be adding more. I really would like some straw to be doing this. It'd be perfect, just a layer of straw over, and constantly patting it down to prevent any sort of, you want a flat surface, you don't want that oxygen getting in on the sides of stuff. There's that piece of wet paper towel. I don't know what brand it is, but it was extremely absorbent of the rainwater. So yeah, you can see a couple chunks on top there. That's all right. Okay, now what you don't want to do is let it sit like that smoldering. So the next step, I'm either going to add more fuel to keep it burning a bit, have a fire on top, or douse it. When you're done with your fire, right, don't let it sit or it'll just turn to ash. <clears throat> you want to get some cold water, as cold as possible without, you know, don't spend money on ice or something, but cold ice water would be great. Okay, the idea is this is really hot. I'm going to hit it with a whole bunch of cold water all at once, and it's going to break open all the pores and all, just make micro fractures throughout the uh, charcoal, giving it a larger surface area. So, <clears throat> what I have here is two five gallon pails and a garden hose hooked up to. Uh, Two horsepower pump. So this can put out the fire pretty quick. So if you have a friend or somebody who can help, put the buckets in from opposite sides. But I find the two five gallon buckets is pretty much enough water. Hey! enough water for this size of hole to fill up with water you can see there and everything flows so you see all the charcoal I made everything uh, hasn't disappeared some of it uh, I see there didn't burn all the way looks like that was uh, I don't want the dog drinking the water out of the hose she gets a really bad diarrhea from it so. I'm going to go turn that off, but I think you got the idea, right? You get a hose, get a dog, make sure the fire's out. Good idea to hose down all around it, a meter or two, a yard or two around the fire, in case any hot ashes that come out. You want to start a forest fire when you go sit down, relax, right? A yard of fire or whatever. Yeah, so that's all there is to it. So once this is uh, the fire's out and cooled off, as you can see when she stepped in it, it's, it's all floating. This is uh, thoroughly uh, soaked. Again, this is... It's okay to use chlorinated water, they do house water or whatever. 
just like your biochar set for overnight or whatever, and the chlorine will evaporate. And chlorine is helpful in ways in biochemistry. Uh, anyways, hey there. I'll turn this off and deal with the dog if I can. Sorry about all that. Excitement, eh? So to make the fire you just saw, and this is what I used, if you remember from the beginning of the video how much was there. I used maybe half of it, I would say, so I can have another fire tomorrow or later this evening. But uh, I just thought I'd show you what I used to make this. And then I'll show you what this is and uh, how it turned out. When you're convinced that it's uh, out and isn't going to burn or melt anything, you remove it from the hole. So again, this is about two hours after I started. So a good estimate for a small burn. See how many uh, five gallon pails I can fill. Probably more than two. Usually I just uh, bring the wheelbarrow over. That gets full of biochar I'm processing. Which I'll show you in a minute. It's all, all related. Oh. Yeah, that's all there is. Yeah. So I'm just going to continue digging this out. And what you get, let's see if I can get this in the camera. This is what you get. This is the finished, it should just break right up. Nice and crunchy, nice good charcoal. Now, of course, it's wet. It's much more dramatic when it's when it's dry. It'll have a silvery hue to it, and it'll sound like glass breaking. But yeah, high quality charcoal, super easy, right in your backyard. And again, any pieces that didn't com completely uh, carbonize. I'll just throw back in the next fire. But I'm just going to continue digging this out and I'll bring you over and show you the next step. Well here's what I got. Uh, the hole's empty. I got two five gallon buckets of charcoal and probably a dozen or so uh, of the larger pieces or the pieces I put on at the later stages. Uh, that didn't burn all the way through. I'll just throw those back in the next one, no big loss. But for a small fire, that significant amount of charcoal, that would do well, fairly large. I'd say that probably four by four by a foot deep garden area, at least. You know, it depends on what you're using it for, how much you like to use, depending on your soil type you're starting with. That's a significant amount. Less than two hours, I'll show you what to do with it next. Once you have your charcoal out of the burn pit, you're going to need to put it somewhere to charge it. And what I use is this old kiddie pool. I think it's uh, four feet across, maybe. It's got a crack in the bottom, makes it useless as a pool, but perfect for my purposes. Of course, your uh, charcoal has to be cold or a melted plastic. Now, if you don't have a kiddie pool, you don't need a kiddie pool. This is just what I'm using. I'm showing you how I do it. You can put it on the ground, okay? Put it on the ground. If it's thick enough, nothing will grow through it. And it'll, it'll be even better than a kiddie pool because the worms and all that will come up through it. Although I get worms in this too. I don't know how they get in there, but they get in there. So, maybe to crack in the bottom. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is transfer the freshly made charcoal. Remember, it's not biochar yet. So, you didn't need to find yourself a place, just like you would a, a pile of compost or something, right? 
square yourself away a, a small area, maybe on a piece of ground that's uh, bad, right? Uh, residual charcoal from you doing stuff will improve the soil. Okay, so I'm just going to dump the charcoal into my charging area. You can imagine that as anything, a corner in your yard or whatever. I do like kitty pool for this. Keeps it contained. Great stuff. Alright. So. Now what I have. And I'll show you. Not too much trouble with the camera hopefully. It's another five gallon pail. This is what I do for liquid fertilizer. I take any weeds or anything I'm pulling out as I'm gardening and I throw it in a pail, some rainwater, it all rots down, all the uh, nutrients, everything that's in the plants and the plants themselves break down into the water. And this is a quick way to charge charcoal in a biochar. Uh, you add not just once but continuously add over a few weeks and it'll be well charged. Now, I've also tested what's in compost tea. Where is that? Okay, so what I did was I took one of the soil test things, right? Test, and then I diluted the already dilute compost tea I believe it was 10 to 1 with uh, distilled water. This is uh, potash, right? Your potassium. <clears throat> that was in excess. And then uh, phosphorus was in excess. I tested uh, fresh tea, which had uh, adequate, according to the chart, fresh tea I mean within a week of it being made of weeds added to water it had adequate nitrogen I tested this for instance was you're looking at there which is more than two weeks old <clears throat> and uh, I tested also another one I had in the house they both had like I said high phosphorus high potassium but only the fresh tea had uh, any nitrogen this tea has no nitrogen that shows up when diluted uh, 10 to 1 ratio of already dilute and this already drained out but was the pH test and of course it's compost so it was as expected it was about 6.5 so or 7 in between 6.5 and 7 it was a you know a, a green green color so that's what's in tea that's what I tested as far as MPK goes and pH. Now of course there's other micronutrients and microorganisms and that's a whole can of worms, no pun intended. But if you're interested in anything other than a simple liquid fertilizer, I suggest uh, JADAM, J-A-D-D-A-M. It's a South Korean, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, gardening ideology I guess. Uh, but very uh, diversified teas for different things, for pest control, for fertilizer, for whatever. That's the source for that. I am just charging with nutrients and microbiology some charcoal because I'm making it into biochar. So it's as easy as this. You just pour in some compost tea. Now it's late October, like I said, and I'm uh, winterizing my garden also, so I wanted to pour this out on something. I would have poured it out on my already charged charcoal. Now nitrogen. Nitrogen is going to come from worms, from rain, uh, the next thunderstorm. As long as you got some microbiology and good soil to support worms, worms will work in. The nitrogen cycle is not dependent on you putting nitrogen in. But if you are insistent on uh, adding nitrogen to charge your charcoal, uh, the best 
fastest, most efficient way, I'll charge it immediately, is use urine. Just make sure you're not, uh, the urine you're using isn't from something or someone that's on medications or has uh, diseases or parasites. So, if you can find, find it clean, use it if you want. I use compost tea, it's good enough for me. I have no problems. All right, so that's gonna sit, because in my instance, it's gonna sit probably over winter before I use it. But right now I am uh, getting some prepared to use in the house over winter and for my spring plantings. So, what you see on the right where the shovel is, is already charged charcoal. You can see there's dandelions growing in it and such. Before I poured this in, you could see the bottom is all plastic. So once it's charged, I mean, it's very healthy, just on its own and stuff grows. The light is fading, but you can see there's greenery growing on the charcoal itself. Okay, so after I let it sit for a few weeks, keep adding some compost, tea. There's various things you can add, whatever you have. If you have chicken manure, throw this on the bottom where your chickens run, or throw the manure in here, mix it around, any sort of uh, goats. You know, if you have sea kelp or whatever, you're by the ocean, throw that in here, right? If you have worms in your basement, and you got uh, the vermiculture stuff going on, throw that in there too, right? The worm castings, whatever you have. But if you don't have anything, the way I'm doing it is the easiest. If you got some weeds growing somewhere, throw them in a bucket, make some liquid fertilizer, use that. Or you can pee on it. There. So what I do to process it to get ready to use, because it's all different size chunks and everything, it's not good to put in your soil like that. I mean, it could be all right, but it's not the most efficient way. So what I'm going to do is just shovel it up. All right, this is my awesome editing skills, right? Because I, I'm not here to make videos. I'm here because I'm making, you know, gardening stuff for myself and I'm sharing it because it's, it's awesome. It helps, it will help you if you pay attention to it. Okay, so what I have here is a screen contraption I made out of a quarter inch hardware cloth. And then I just run the charcoal through this. This is what I wanted to avoid. I grated it along and it's all the noise. But you can just uh, force it through. Do it much uh, more firm than I am right now. I don't want to make a bunch of noise for the audio. So all I do is run that through. Okay. Whatever doesn't go through the quarter inch hardware cloth. I have a container with a flat bottom. I found that uh, five gallon buckets do not work well for this because the, the bottom's slightly off the ground. So when you pound down with the hammer, it uh, breaks the bottom of the bucket. So anything that doesn't go through the hardware cloth. Wet from the Compost tea I poured in. Okay, I toss that in a bucket. And I got a, uh, I don't know how many pounds this sledge is. I guess I could look at it. It's a, you know, really heavy one, at least five pounds. Okay, now, is this the best way to break up your process for biochar? If you're trying to add biochar to an acre of garden or something, uh, this is gonna take you forever, right? So there's other ways, you can put it in a bag. I saw people run over it with their tractor. Um, I've seen people use a garburator. Uh, if you do it like that, make sure you got lots of water, adding water to it because any dust that comes up from this and you breathe in, you get that coal miner's lung or whatever. I can't remember the uh, medical term <clears throat> for the condition it gives you, but uh, it'll ruin your lungs. So if it's really dry, I wear a mask. Of course, I'm not wearing a mask, but 
Yeah, so I'll crush it up, put it back through the screen again, right? And then any pieces that go, go, go through the screen, returning them to the bucket and repeat the process. There are other ways to break it up. That's how I do it. Of course, I'm not starting a garden. I already have established gardens and I don't use uh, a lot of biochar right now. I'm going to open up some in-ground gardening or maybe even change gardening locations. So who knows, right? I may need a whole lot more and that's simply digging a bigger cone, getting more material gathered and finding a better way to crush it up. But this is what you get. You get a powder, not quite a powder, you get chunks, some of it's powder from the burn, you know, I do burn a lot of small things, and then I do crush it up with the hammer. Okay, now this will be added to the soil, which again, yeah, and back to where we started, and that's how I built my soil. You want to see how I mix the biochar in? Maybe you can recognize the charcoal in here now. The light is not good out here. All right, it's autumn and late in the day. But that's how I get this kind of soil. All right? That's how I turn. Okay, this. This is my topsoil here. I'm going to focus on there. This is my topsoil as it as I dig it up. This is sat and dried out. Crumbly, hard, gray, nasty. Okay, this, the grass and leaf compost you can see there, and the biochar mixed once with just a yearly annual mulch in the fall, which is my winterization of my garden, makes this. Right? This looks like it came out of an expensive bag of gardening stuff. Except this will last forever where the expensive bag of gardening stuff, you know, a couple months, until all the organic matter disappears. Right? I don't have to add a whole bunch of anything. In the spring I don't have to shovel manures and tons of compost. Just to this is all I do, all right? I'm mowing the lawn anyways. I take the bag of leaves and grass, all right? I make a pile of them. That's the compost I use is cold composted leaf and grass. So any soil, new soil mix I make, I have a pile of these. And in the fall, I just put leaves on top. It protects my soil, feeds the microorganisms and the worms. And as you can see with your own eyes, beautiful soil. And this bed grew beautiful tomatoes, which hopefully I'll make a how to do sauce. So, if you found any of this helpful or interesting, and you'd like to know more about sustainable organic gardening, that's easy and affordable, more about biochar incorporating into the soil. I do have videos on mixing into the soil on the ratio I use that particular day when I was measuring at least and various ways I'm using it uh, seedlings and such and I'll be uh, of course taking it into the house and making more videos as, uh, as, he, as I prepare for next season but uh, yeah for e what easy affordable and sustainable organic gardening uh, Please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. Uh, join me on the channel as a friend. Always happy to make new friends. And I'm uh, excited to get to know you all. Hope you have a great day, wherever you are, whenever you watch this. Peace.